All right, this is the redo of the Upper Midwest Old Timey Listening Party, episode number 11. My first attempt was live, and uh, it did not go so well. Something about my inter internet connection or something. So we're just going to record it here, and we're going to put it up, and then all of you can watch it at your leisure. Um, today's episode's got a lot of great stuff in it. I wanted to start first by um, saying that I wanted to start, I, sh I need to thank my supporters that support the show more than I do. So I want to send shouts out to the folks who've helped out in the last few weeks. Jordan, Dustin, Lisa, Steve, Robert, Joe, Kristen, Mary Pat, David, Eric, Fralin, John, and whoever else I might have missed that's helped me out lately. I appreciate it. If you want to donate and support the show, up in the corner there, it's PayPal. It's unarmedjournal at hotmail.com. Venmo, it's at clawhammermike. So now that we got the business taken care of, let's get down to the show. We got some good stuff today. We got a little segment on harmonicas in Upper Midwest music. Um, it's not really like a subject that I knew a lot about. Um, you know, I didn't know that harmonicas play Norwegian music, Swedish music, all kinds of different music. Um, of course you can. It's a diatonic instrument, so it makes sense. Uh, so we're going to have a little harmonica segment um, uh, in the Upper Midwest, which has uh, three different tunes by three different folks. And then we're going to have an interview with Beth Rado, who's one of my favorite Upper Midwest fiddlers and uh, preservers of this music. Um, she... She she cares a lot about uh, the old music and preserving it and making sure that it stays current and is modernly played with her band, The Footnotes. So we're going to talk to her tonight. And also, uh, we're going to have... I've decided to uh, unearth one of... Uh, in my collection, I have... Uh, my collection of videos, I have a video of Leonard Finseth. Um, and it was a thing produced by Robert uh, Andreessen for... Uh, Wisconsin Public Radio, and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna unearth that tonight, and we're gonna we're gonna play that. That's about ten minutes long. It's a great, you know, it's like a news story, so it's a great, well produced story. So we're gonna do that, and then the third thing we're gonna do tonight that's real special is we're gonna have uh, Dick Dick Hensold an interview with Dick Hensold. Now. What this is, is this is a new segment for me. We're branching out and we're going to, you know, most of what we've been doing so far in our interviews is talking about folks preserving upper Midwest tunes. Up, you know, tunes that were played here hundreds of years ago, you know, that have been played, played by the old timers. Well, this segment is going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk to modern folks, modern folks in the upper Midwest who play old time music from anywhere, you know, whether it be, you know, any kind of traditional music. In this case, uh, Dick Hensold, he plays uh, um, Northumbrian pipes, amongst other things, including the Swedish bagpipe and every, everything. He plays a bunch of different instruments. But we're going to specifically talk to him about his uh, fascination with Northumbrian pipes. So, and plus other stuff we got on the show tonight, too. It's going to be a good one. So let's start right away, and let's get into some harmonica music. Um, this 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 first tune, we're going to go to uh, central Wisconsin, and we're going to visit... Um, uh, it's, from, it's from the archive of Larry Finseth, who's a good buddy of mine. And uh, we've played a lot of his videos from his collection, but this is this is a great look into a into a Wisconsin jam. It's got uh, two accordions, a bass guitar, an acoustic guitar, someone playing spoons, and um, this harmonica player whose name is John and I don't know his last name. But it's a great it's a great look into a Midwestern jam, and this kind of got me started on my oh maybe we should do we sh maybe we should do a little harmonica segment. So here we go.
any of you are musicians out there, you all know what happened there with the uh, you, the lead instrument. You think they're stopping, and you're all ready to stop, and then they just keep going, and you gotta be like, oh yeah, we're going now. I noticed that at the at the last pass of that one. That's what makes it home music, man. That's home music is the best, you know, better than anything on stage, in my opinion. So uh, next of off in our harmonica section, we're gonna have R Ronald Roweller. And uh, he's from up in northern Minnesota, and he has recently passed away. Um, we know, I know his son Paul, and uh, an internet friend of mine, and uh, he he's posted over the years a bunch of great uh, videos of his his father Ronald playing playing the harmonica, playing tunes, playing whether it's German tunes or Scandinavian tunes or American tunes, whatever, just bust them out out on harmonica. And I've always thought I should include one of those, and now's the time, because we have this little three-song harmonica section. So uh, we're going to get to him, but first I wanted to read this nice little thing that Paul wrote for him, for this show. He said, Dad was born out on the Fox Home Flats, west of Fergus Falls, Minnesota, in September of 1942. He learned to play harmonica at a very early age, learning from his grandmother and dad. As of his passing last month, he had been playing regularly every day at jams whenever possible for all of 68 years. The amount of music he knew was almost unfathomable. So many songs. He was heavily influenced by his German roots, but grew up in the midst of Scandinavian heritage. Dad also played guitar and accordion. Music was a pastime a child of humble background could afford. Which I just think is a beautiful, loving tribute there. So we're going to get straight to that now. Next up in our little harmonica segment here is going to be the playing of Pat Ford. Pat Ford was recorded by the Library of Congress in 1938 um, on their rounds. They used to do rounds through the country to record traditional music back in the day. Um, government paid for it. And uh, he was first recorded, he did a bunch of ballad singing in northern Wisconsin. But then um, he and then the rest of his family moved out to California to help build the Shasta Dam out in California. And um, the same woman who collected him up in northern Minnesota ended up uh, visiting him out in California. Out in California, he only had his harmonica, and uh, he ended up playing um, a great tune that he learned up in the Wisconsin woods. And he says that in the beginning of his recording. He says, you know, I learned learned this tune up in the up in the Wisconsin woods. And it's a it's a Swedish shadish. Um great great play it on harmonica. The only thing is it's a recording from nineteen thirty eight, so you're gonna it's gonna be a little bit quieter, um, because of the hissing and the popping that's going on. So you might have to turn your turn your uh speaker up a little bit on this one. But uh, this is this is Pat Ford back in 1938, and this is the final track of our little harmonica track here. Thank you. 
Alright, so next we're going to go down to near my hometown. My hometowns are um, Jackson and Sherburne down in southwestern Minnesota. That's where my people are from. Seven generations of my family are buried in the graveyard down there. And um, we're going to go down there, but just a little bit north of there, to a little town called Odin, Minnesota. And we're going to visit the Great Plain of Sydney Mathestead. I've been listening to this... It's really a tape. It was a field recording. I've been listening to this so much lately. I just think it's great fiddling. And just this perfect, like, um, like mild accordion backup behind it. So let's check out Sydney down there. <laughs> Happy bouncy little Rhinelander slash Shottish right there. Um, next up, we're going to go down to uh, northeastern Iowa, and we're going to go visit Beth Rado. We're doing an interview with her, and uh, I just think the world about Beth. I'm, I'm glad that she's done. She spent her life, really, doing all kinds of great research and also playing at the knee of these great old-timers who are long since gone out of our world now. And uh, we might not have a connection to folks like Bill Sherburn unless unless Beth Rado actually sat at his knee and learned these tunes. So, um, yeah, I just, well, let's get talking to Beth. It's um, great having her on the show. All right, this is Claw Hammer Mike here with Beth Rado. Beth Rado is one of my heroes of Upper Midwest music. Um, she sat at the knee of Bill Sherburn and learned a bunch of his traditional uh, music. And in general, just really cares about the region's music. Does a lot of preserving of the old fiddle music in the Upper Midwest. And one of the real, you know, what I would consider warriors of uh, Upper Midwest music. So thank you, Beth, for being on the show. And uh, tell us about how you got started in the world of fiddle. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I started to play the violin in school. My grandma had a brother who made me a violin. He was um, Clifford Jacobson from uh, Madison, Minnesota. 
so I just played an orchestra at school and into college a little bit and I wasn't too good but when I uh, when I didn't have a piano anymore piano had been my main instrument when I didn't have a piano anymore in my house um, I got my violin out a little bit more and there isn't many things that I liked how I could play classical music by myself and then I heard a radio show that had a Scandinavian fiddling on it and I loved it I we had cassettes I recorded a cassette of it and I learned the tunes off of there and that really got me started actually because um, John and I John who lives here could play guitar and we could figure out waltzes and polkas and yeah so I think it was that gift that really got me started. Yeah, how old were you when that happened? Oh, uh, fifth grade was when when I started to play. However old you are then, ten or eleven. Yeah. yeah, and then when I started playing the uh, Scandinavian stuff, I was probably well. I already li liked hearing this kind of music when I was in college, but I started playing it after college, shortly after college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, who was the first uh, person in the upper Midwest that you gravitated towards as far as fiddlers go? Well, definitely Bill Sherburn, because I was a dancer at the dances at Highlandville, where he was the, the main fiddler. And um, those were really fun events for me. They were all ages, a lot of people from the neighborhood. Some um, Highlandville, it, it just has a general store and a few houses it's just a really beautiful spot kind of by a fishing stream and um yeah i liked going out there and dancing and then bill sherburn kept talking about how he was going to quit and at that same time there was a little ad in our paper um from the iowa arts council that they were looking for apprentices for their master apprentice pro uh, program so i ended up meeting Bill um, through his piano player who was my friend's mom asked if we could do this uh, master apprenticeship program and you know he didn't really quite answer me I don't think but his friend his my friend's mom was sure that he was going to do it so I signed us up and then I wasn't so sure when I got there that he was very happy to see me but um, it, we had kind of a rough start, but then I brought John along with his guitar, and then that kind of mm. improved things. Yeah, mm. yeah. And then he then he started remembering things that he hadn't played for a while, and um, yeah. Then it got to be kind of some nice some nice um, nice sessions, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many tunes did you learn from him? I learned everything he was playing at that time. I kind of had a shorthand. I wrote them out. I probably sixty. Mm -hmm. tunes maybe something like that and then he'd come up with some older ones or some ones I hadn't heard different times um he'd say oh I woke up and I remembered this one or that one do you still play them all today or what how many of them have kept in your repertoire and how many have kind of gone away do you think there are some basic ones that I will always play every time I get out you know get to a dance or whatever but I wasn't such a good fiddler back then. And now I've actually gone back and learned some of the harder ones. Mm. And they're not great now, but, but before I could not play a single thing that was, that went to third position or anything. And he had a few that went up high. And so I try those now and they maybe sound a little squeaky, but um, so I've kind of adjusted what I play. And then once in a while, maybe John will say, what is this? And he'll be playing something on the guitar. I'm going, well, what is that? And then we'll start playing it. And sure enough, that'll be a tune we've kind of let drop for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to have kind of notebooks organized by um, Fiddler so that I can kind of, sometimes I just get that out and go, what about this one? What about that one? Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. So, and he says he's self-taught, but there was a lot of Fiddlers up in Spring Grove where he was from. His grandma played. Um, and so he was really influenced by a lot of fiddlers, I, I know, from that area that were the generation before him um, or his contemporaries, too, I suppose. But then he he kind of toured a bit in the 20s, but then he stopped playing when he had a family. He, he, I think he had like five farms and he had four boys and he had he was a horse trader. He loved telling stories about how he cheated somebody on a horse that he sold them, you know. <laughs> 
he was doing all this other stuff. And then it was when he retired, he got his fiddle out again. He really had a, an old fashioned style because he just still played what he had played back in the 1920s. Uh -huh. um, and his repertoire was some of the popular things from them, some of the ragtimey things from them, some of the things his neighbors played, some of the things from the radio, some of the grandma's things. Yeah, so he was an interesting guy. He didn't say very much. He, um, in fact, if he wanted to say something, his wife would call and he'd go, there's somebody here that wants to talk to you. And then there'd be this pause. And then he'd, he'd come on, he'd say, right on. And then he'd say, I got a tune for you. And then he would say, when are you coming up? And so that was kind of fun, but he never said too much. And if, he kind of mumbled. So if I asked him a question, I had to, I, I didn't get like very many tune names and I don't think he remembered tune names or two, not too many stories from him, mostly tunes. I tried to sit and just exactly pretend like I was him. Like, you know, his jaw and he'd be playing and I just try to match everything he did, which was, was great. That's the thing we can't do anymore because they're all gone, you know, we have, we have recordings of some older folks, but we can't, we can't just sit at their knee anymore. So, you know, that's great that you got yeah. that experience. So, um, and then I know it doesn't just stop with him. I know that you've done research on a bunch of different fiddlers. So maybe talk about your research down in Iowa and what you've been doing down there. I know it's just a hop and a skip over the border, but. What I did um, in the 1990s was I, worked with some of the older women in town who had either accompanied their dads or their grandpas um, or who knew stories about them. Um, and I tried to get a bunch of tunes that they could remember, especially from my friend Ellen Blagan. And she took me to visit a man whose uncle had been a fiddler. I think several in his family have been a fiddler, but his uncle in particular, we were talking about his uncle, and he said, yes, he played all the Arndt waltzes. And I said, what are Arndt waltzes? Well, there was a Johann Arndt who had been a fiddler in the neighborhood who had been very good. And as they talked, they, they talked about how beautiful his handwriting was, and that he'd written down these tunes. And I was just intrigued about that. And so this friend, Ellen Blagan, she ended up, calling everywhere. She called Canada and California and Minnesota and Nevada and she found this tune book that they'd been talking about, the tune books, um, under the bed of, um, of a great, great, great granddaughter of, uh, no, a great granddaughter of this Johann Arm. So um, that's ended up to be kind of two projects, the project with the women here in Decor in the 90s and then now I'm still working on um, the Johann Arndt's tunes from that tune book. Last year, our band had helped, uh, we got a, a grant to have everything transcribed into standard notation by somebody. And now we're going through and choosing some songs out of there and we're gonna work, uh, work up a concert, which would have been this weekend, but now it's gonna be a year from this weekend. Um, and that will be uh, tunes from Johann Arndt's tune book, so. I'm coming down for that. That's in a year. That's that's a nice thing to look forward to. Yeah. I've seen a picture of his fiddle. It has a burn mark on it from him smoking, you know, like where the ashes <laughs> fell while he was playing. <laughs> so. That's good. All right. Yeah. So what, what tune do you want to zero in on today? Uh, I know that that's, that's kind of what we do on the show is we, we uh, zero in on a tune that's important to you for whatever reason. And I'm wondering what your, what your tune is today that we're doing. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to share world's largest shottish then. Okay, great. Um, a few years ago, our band turned 25 and um, for that event, I wanted to do something really spectacular. And so we decided to organize the world's largest shottish. And we, I wanted to have a special tune to play for it. So I wrote this tune, which I have only written a couple tunes, um, but I wrote this tune so that we'd have a brand new tune to play and we would have lots of dancers. And it was beyond my wildest dreams. We had a goal of a thousand dancers, which seemed like kind of pretty much unbelievable. And we had 1,881 dancers sign up and I'm sure there were some that 
just stepped out there and started dancing. But it was it was truly awesome. Yeah. We had um, the street blocked off because it was Nordic Fest, and it was pretty much as far as you could, where I could see in either direction was all people dancing. Luckily, we hired a sound system, a sound person to run a sound system from Madison that came over with a big setup so that people could hear it. But yeah, I, you know, they didn't move too far because they were so packed in, but uh -huh. that was, that was, um, that was our big hurrah. So I'm going to give you that tune to play, I think. And it set a world's record, right? The world's, it did it, didn't it actually set a world's record? Well, it, it definitely did. Cause the, like the largest, I think the largest waltz or something was like 400, but let me tell you, I don't like Guinness. They're a racket because um, we applied in January, in January and to be the world's largest shotish. And then we got a letter right at the beginning of right in the, maybe the middle of June that said, actually we can't have the world's largest shotish because that's the same as a uh, polka and so you would have to do world's largest polka what? and you'd have to reapply and you would have to send a bunch of money to fast track it through because now it's too late oh, and that's... we just went oh poo. oh poo that doesn't work we are doing a shotish and it's not a polka and so we did it so i know we have the world's largest because yeah, we don't we don't no need, we don't need dennis to tell us that we no we can tell it ourselves <laughs> cool yeah, yeah. I remember watching the video. It was pretty, it looked like a pretty special occasion. I wanted to come down for it, but there's something that stopped me and I, I've, re I've regretted it since. So it's uh. cool. It's cool <laughs> you're doing this song. That, that'll be great. Where can we find your stuff? What, what merchandise do you have available? Anything you want to promote? Anything like that? Well, we, all we have right now, we took down our website. Um, we're not doing any performances except maybe a couple weddings in September. So Right now, it just would be to contact us through our Facebook page. We have a, um, it's called Face, uh, it's called Footnotes Fans is our page, and it's F O O T hyphen capital N O T E S. We have um, Decora Waltz, a CD called Decora Waltz, a CD called My Father Was a Fiddler. That's the one that has a little booklet with all sorts of information about the local fiddlers, mm -hmm. including pictures and stuff. Great CD, great booklet. Yeah. Um, and then the other project that I was involved in was the new Ole Hendrix Orchestra. I've got CDs from that, which was a year ago. We had a concert from another old tune book, which is another story. But anyway. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a real, real treasure to finally get to talk to you about all this stuff on record, you know? So thanks a lot for yeah. hanging out with us. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.
right, that was foot footnotes there with um, their their shadish that Beth wrote, and uh, I'm gonna have to learn that one. Pretty pretty cool tune. Um, next up, we're gonna stay in Iowa, and we're gonna go visit Dwight Lamb in Iowa, Iowa. Great uh, button box player, and he's a really great fiddler too. But right now, we're gonna listen to him play the button box. His friends call him affectionately Red. <laughs> land there he meets it on our show uh, kind of often uh if you haven't watched the show before um dwight dwight's just D dwight's a great guy he's one of our living you know one of our living old timers you know he's up there he's in his 80s but he's still kicking the nicest fellow you'd ever meet in your entire life so uh you know I, I know I have an open invitation to go visit them anytime I'm down there. So, you know, sometime sometime soon I died down there and hang out with Dwight. Um, anywho, next up we're going to go, this is uh, another special segment here. This is that Leonard Finseth video I was talking about early. This is a 10-minute video that uh, Wisconsin Public Television produced. Uh, I think it was, you know, like I said, Robert Andresen from Duluth. He, he produced this uh, segment, I do believe. At least it has a lot of his footage. And uh, it's just a cool look, cool look into Leonard's life and music, you know, done done like a news story, you know, but like a 10 minute news story. So this is cool. We'll check this out. This township here is six miles square. It is called Lent, L-E-N-T, from the Yankees. Uh. But then they start coming in from uh, from uh, Hollingdahl. Quite a few of them. There were Golden's Roots and uh, Hogganesses and different ones. And so it got to be quite a few of them, and they circulated the petition, and. So they got this here township then named Drammen now. After Drammen, Norway, I guess that's pretty close to the Halling area, isn't it? Well, here's where I was born. This house right here. 
I think it was about 1970, I became acquainted with uh, Otto Rindlisbacher of Rice Lake, Wisconsin, and uh, he told me that I should contact Leonard if I wanted to learn some old-time Norwegian tunes and learn more about this music. So one time I made a long-distance telephone call to Leonard, and he said, yeah, come on down for the weekend, and we'll play some music and do some taping. And So I guess I came for the weekend and filled about three reel-to-reel tapes with music, and uh, from that we, uh, I guess this has been going on, well, probably 15, 16 years. No, I've never heard it around here. Did you get that from the Sorensons? Or? Yeah. Oh. I think it's uh, Nels Eglon. Oh. He was uh, Truman's uncle, too, you know. I see. My grandfather was from uh, Gubran Stalin. They were called the Finse Tre back at 1520. That oh. was the name then. Oh. So, uh, I guess the roots actually are from uh, back in that area, too, you know. But I see. There's where Zingo Syverson was from, you know. Oh. So. so you learned a lot of tunes from him. Yeah, from, and uh, Uncle Ed, uh, my uncle uh, knew quite a bit of the, the few of the same tunes, you know, that you knew too, you know. Oh, yeah. We'll try that one then, no? D polka? Yeah. Okay. on uh, harmonica to begin with and uh, when he was a teenager and then switched to the button accordion and uh, then to the fiddle but uh, prior to this he had walked to some of these barn dances and a lot of the neighbors in around this community were Norwegian American uh, fiddlers some of them I guess first generation from Norway and some second generation and uh, it seems he's learned uh, some tunes from each of these people and he identifies them with uh, with each fiddler that he learned them from. <laughs> I forget. I forget what tune it was. Should we play a tune right now? Yeah. Uh, Randy Severson Walt? Yeah. Well, who is Randy Severson? Did she live around here? Yeah, they lived over southeast of here. She played the fiddle and her two brothers, Colonel and Pete. Hmm. But you know, uh, right before thrashing time, a lot of people here used to go out to the west for the get thrashing, the shocking and out to Dakotas or thrashing, yeah, out in the uh, Dakotas, Montana's. Yeah. She went out west to be a, a cook. You know, the big thrash rigs they had a shanty with them. Mm-hmm. So she went, got a job as a cook. Then there was another fellow from northern part of Minnesota that was going to run a steam engine. His name was Sam Severson. Well, there's where they got acquainted out west oh. and got married while he was running a steam engine and she was the cook for the crew. Oh. So, so uh, I heard her play different times and I thought, well, I always did like to learn at least one tune from uh, different uh, fiddlers and stuff. And I thought this tune that we're going to play now was one I learned after her, you know. Kind of on you. Was there very many? Were there very many women fiddlers around? Or no, she was the only one I knew. Of. Oh, yeah, up around here. So this this waltz you're going to play is one of that came yeah. from her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
the, the first fiddle. But then it took me a year or two before I got into it pretty good. You had to read a bear down on the fiddle, you know. I took the Navy then, so I was on, the, on that one ship for over three years. Then I uh, took over this place off then, and, you know, this place here then. I probably have about 15, 18 acres at least of hay, hay ground to put up. And then I'll have the old stone here, Havre, you know. And you can't tell, I might pull a trash, trash rig out again. I had it out last year, a year ago. One year I've been having corn and next year oats. Corn and oats, I've been getting enough crop corn that's going to go me for two years. And so that's about all I do now. It isn't much, just something for exercise, you know. like a great life that Leonard lived on the farm there and that one one farm his whole entire life he lived there um, it's pretty pretty amazing um, next up we're gonna have uh, our interview with Dick Hensold um, this is that new feature I was talking about where we take modern uh, traditional musicians from the upper Midwest and we see what music they're playing whether it be, um, you know, whatever culture they're into. In this case, it happens to be the Northumbrian Pipes. So we're going to talk to Dick Hensel here. This is Clawhammer Mike here with Dick Hensel. He lives in St. Paul here, and he's been playing traditional music forever. I saw him last year playing uh, Northumbrian Pipes at uh, the Cedar Cultural Center. Great show. Um, he used to play with my buddy Dick Reese a bunch. We've talked about Dick Reese a bunch on, on this, this show and other shows, and... Uh, you know, so we're just going to get to know Dick here and talk about traditional music with him. So what is your relationship? How did you get started in traditional music? Well, uh, I uh, mainly, I just like it. I wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't an impulse that, uh, it wasn't a cultural impulse at all. I just like the sound of it. But I tell you, um, I got into traditional music. I think I started first playing Irish tunes on, on whistle and things like that. And then I really got interested in bagpipes. And you know, people who are, people who are obsessive about bagpipes are, are sort of, it's a, it's a species of their own. The, 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 and uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted a bagpipe that I could do anything at all with. And um, so, uh, so I, I, uh, researched and I got a Northumbrian small pipe because they're cool. And now I'm and now I'm a bagpipe geek. Do you play the music of Northumbria on there or what what do you do on these uh, Northumbrian pipes? Well, it, it, that's interesting that you should ask. Now now Northumbrian small pipes of course, I mean they, they they're they're really unique among different kinds of bagpipes. They the bottom end of the chanter is plugged up. So you don't you don't get anything out of the uh, you don't get anything out of the chanter when you're uh, when all your finger holes are closed like this, and uh, so it it 
it can it can articulate it can make bowings like a violin can or it can play um it can play ornaments like a highland pipe can and so it's very versatile it also has you see all these silver things it also has full of keys that give it um lots of extra notes so i can play lots of different i can play fiddle tunes on it or i can play songs on it i can play traditional northumbrian pipe tunes on it so it's very real versatile instrument and that's um why i took it up being a bagpipe geek as i told you um so the when i started out i i wasn't that interested in northumbrian traditional music but you know in playing um playing northumbrian pipes i got more interested in northumbrian traditional music and i found that it really is that the northumbrian tradition is very different than a lot of the Celtic music that we're familiar with, the Scottish tradition and the Irish tradition. And uh, um, one tune in particular, I learned, I learned early on, um, I learned early on because, because I had the chance to study with a teacher who was really a very good player and he was touring around. And I had a chance to, to have a lot of of back to back lessons with him and I and and so I was trying to get the, you know with traditional music a lot of it's all about timing the timing's got to be right if you're playing a jig or a reel or something I mean it's like the tune is important but if you play that if you play that reel and it doesn't sound like a reel nobody thinks you're getting it and and so in a way, the tune is important, but also the, the 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 traditional oral playing style is more important. And I was trying to get that down with this teacher. I'd been playing for about probably a year and a half at that point, and he said, "Well, I, I, and I and I said, there's a certain there's a certain way of timing slow airs that sounds really unique in in Northumberland, and I want." To know what that's about and so he taught me this tune he said so this isn't a traditional tune this is a tune i wrote but the thing is if i teach you a traditional tune there'll be people who are telling me telling you that that um oh alistair did it wrong because <laughs> they all they all argue about they all argue about the, the correct way of doing it so, so I'm gonna instead of do, teaching a traditional tune, I'm gonna teach you a tune that I wrote because at least I can say this is the way I think it should be played, and, I, and I'm gonna give you a. <laughs> so he taught me this tune of his, and um, and if we've got time, I'd like to compare that and play a traditional tune as well. That's kind of the same sort of tune. Now, the the he didn't have a word for this because traditional musicians often don't. But I would say that what what from my other background as a musician, I'd say this was a kind of a rubato. It was it was how you speed up and slow down and take take a slow air out of time. Um, but how they do that in Northumberland is really unique. And and I often, in order to to in conversations with other musicians, I call this the Northumbrian surging rubato, because it it has a way of just sort of pushing ahead at places that you don't really expect and having really erratic. So you want to hear this tune yet? Let's do it. Let's hear it. Okay. This is the air for Maurice Og by Alistair Anderson. Alistair Anderson, I think it was touring, um, Minnesota in 1986. <laughs> That's what I'm so a few years ago. <laughs> Thank you. 
Beautiful tune, and it yeah. it does kind of surge and sway very much so. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know to follow up on that, there's there was another Minnesota Upper Midwest connection. There, to follow up on that, um, uh, probably I think 15 years ago, maybe something about 50. So that would that was in 1986, and probably about 15 years ago, there was a Northumbrian singer who lived in Minnesota. He lived in mm. Thief, Thief River Falls, I think. Yeah. Really, really well-known traditional singer from Northumberland who had lived on the West Coast, who moved to America, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, lived on the West Coast for a long time, and he, and he moved to Thief River Falls. Interesting. Um, and he was in Thief River Falls for a few years. I don't, and I only, in that time, I only met with him once, but I, I got in touch with him and I say, um, I'm a Northumbrian small piper. I'm interested in Northumbrian music. And uh, could I come up and, and uh, can we work on some Northumbrian tunes from the perspective of a singer? Mm -hmm. And he also had grown up. I mean, he, he's de deceased now, but. Um, I moved back to England a few years ago and, and um, died there in his 60s. But he, he, um, he, uh, uh, he also knew some of the old pipers too. So he really, he had a lot of exposure to, to traditional Northumbrian piping in Northumberland. And he, of course, had lots of opinions about, about this, uh, Northumbrian style of vibrato, and and one of the things that he told me was that it, that he believed that it was based on what the singers did, mm -hmm. and which made a lot of sense with what I've learned from other people about traditional music. And when, when you've got a strong tradition, the links between the cultural links between different parts of the music, the the instrumental music and the song and the dance, the cultural links are very strong. So that was Dick Hensel there making that, that final point was really interesting about how he thought that the pipes were really connected to the voice and, you know, just stuff like that is very fascinating to me. You know, it kind of, no matter what kind of music, traditional music you're listening to, like, that's kind of a theme is that a lot of the instruments do follow the singers, you know, and, um, and, and vice versa and they're all interconnected. And, um. Uh, you know, we we I played that video. That was a Skype interview, and we didn't have the best connections. And that tune certainly. What I like to do with tunes is I like to, uh, you know, have the person play it afterwards, not on a Skype call, so that we can get the tune in clear. Clear. But he was just so in the moment. He started doing the tune right then, and as and it it didn't turn out the best quality wise, like as far as recording quality wise. But you know, this show. You know, it's pretty pretty laid back. And also, what 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 I when I really thought about it, I I was thinking about it. And tra traditional music at its best isn't about like like technical proficiency. You know, it's a it's really about being in the moment. You know, being in the moment, sharing stuff with people, sharing music with people, sharing culture with people. You know, that's. That's that's really where its strength is. So I let that 
I let that road as it is for that for that reason alone. Anyways, this has been a fun show. We're right at the hour mark, so I better cut it out here. Uh, let's go out with uh, Elmo Wick. Um, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties uh, from the live stream. This is the recorded version. I'll try and be back here next week with a better setup, and we'll, we'll do the live show again. Thank you so much for supporting me and watching the show and continuing to support Upper Midwest music even during this time of COVID. So thank you. See you all next week. Bye-bye.